as everyone said we had a wonderful uh, three day session on the different topics and today we are on the last topic of uh, income from other sources uh, i'm sure everyone is occupied with their busy schedule of return filing season so let's uh, try and gain and uh, let's try and solve many as many uh, issues or take up as many issues and try and resolve that so that uh, any further issues that we come up with, we can try and uh, take care of that in the four days of the last few days of the return filing to go. Yeah, uh, income from other sources uh, is a is a combination of four sections. Fifty six, fifty six, uh, wherein the first part of fifty six is the charging section. The second one is uh, where specific incomes have been uh, given by the act. Uh, as to those kind or those nature of income will be taxable under EFOS. Uh, under this head, there could be other incomes also, which though not specified uh, in the act, could also be a part of the head income from other sources. And maybe we'll have those slides uh, coming up later so we can discuss that at length. Then, uh, obviously, when you have an income, you won't offer the gross income. You will have an income against which you would like to claim expenses. So your net income is taxable and hence 57 comes out with uh, or gives you a list of, not maybe a list, but gives you the type of expenditure which could be allowed uh, under this uh, head of uh, income. Uh, if 57 is allowing me something to deduct, 58 is telling me that there are certain expenses which will not be deductible. Uh, and the last one would be uh, 59, uh, which will be profits chargeable to tax that we'll see in the coming slides. Yeah, so what kind of income uh, will be covered under the head EFOS? Now, uh, we in the last three days, you must have seen that uh, under the Act, income is taxable under 4 and 5, but under what head they will get bifurcated is what Section 14 tells us. And the other heads being uh, income from salary, house property, business profession, and capital gains. If and if any of my income, uh, any of the amount that I have earned or received, which do not qualify in under any of the five or any of the four heads, uh, salary, HP, business profession, or capital gain, then the tax, dip, uh, the law says that there is a residuary category of income from other sources where this will get covered. So there is no way where the tax, uh, uh, if you're earning income in a particular year, there is no way that you will be out of the ambit of income tax law because if the four heads don't support you, then there is a residuary head which will uh, take into consideration that income and tax you that income. Now, other thing that needs to be kept in mind is that exempt income will never ever be part of your gross total income. So even if you have earned an income not falling under any of the heads, but it is exempt in nature, it will never ever get covered uh, in the in any of the heads, nor it will get covered in the residuary category of category of income from other sources. So this ex this exempt income never forms part of your gross total income. Now, uh, under the law, under the provisions of Section One Forty Five, uh, EFOS that is income from I will be using the word EFOS very frequently, just a shortcut for income from other sources. Now, this income an assessee can account on mercantile system of accounting or he's also permitted to use cash system of accounting. So what would be a cash system would be where he is offering that particular income on a receipt basis and mercantile would be even if he is not receiving it in the uh, financial year, but if he's accruing that income, then he will offer it for income. So depending on the method of accounting followed by the assessee, uh, the income will be taxable. Uh, but uh, whatever method you choose to follow, it has to be a consistent method. So uh, it cannot be that in a year I chose, I'll do mercantile. The next year I chose it to be cash. That cannot be allowed. So whatever you follow, it has to be consistent. And uh, for those assessees who are considering EFOS under mercantile system of accounting, for them, ICDS provisions wherever applicable will apply. Because ICDS tries to cover two heads of income. One is uh, profits from business and gains and the other one is EFOS. So EFOS, if someone is following or offering income under the head, uh, income from other sources, uh, but following cash system of accounting, 
then ICDS does not apply to them. But if he is offering income from under EFOS and following mercantile, it is definitely applicable. So wherever applicable, that needs to be kept in. My first income is dividend income. Now, uh, in I think Finance Act 2020 or 21, we prior to that, we had the regime of Section 115O, where if a company who is declaring dividend, he was the company was required to deduct dividend or pay dividend distribution tax on that particular dividend income. And it was correspondingly uh, exempt under the hands of the shareholder under 1034. But uh, in one of the finance act, this uh, particular section or this regime has been abolished. And now the dividend is taxable in the hands of the respective shareholders. Now, what could be the type of dividend that could get covered? So dividend does not get covered under any of the other heads and hence it comes under EFOS. And what could be the type of it? Uh, any dividend which a particular company declares in the AGM, that could be a type of dividend. Any entity which tries to declare dividend by way of an interim dividend, that could be dividend income. Then uh, units of mutual fund where maybe uh, it's a dividend reinvestment for a dividend payout fund. Those kind of dividend are also income from mutual funds and those get taxed here. Apart from that, we have deemed dividends. So let's let's run through the provisions. What I'll do is I have taken each and every aspect of section 56, 57, 58. And wherever there are issues, I have tried to bring that up. So maybe the slides of that particular head of income, uh, the item of income and its issues will get covered. If, if still there any question remains, maybe we can take up uh, by the audience who can post it in the chat box. So coming back to deemed dividend, uh, Deemed dividend, so why the word deemed? So per se, we in the local common parlance, we understand anything that is distributed or any cash money that is distributed by the company to its shareholder is dividend income. But there are certain categories of income which are deemed, though not per se straight away or in the common parlance known as dividend, but are deemed to be dividend. And those are as follows. So subsection A, 222 is the list where it gives me from A to E, it gives me different scenarios where any distribution by the company will be deemed to be a dividend. So in subsection A, if the company is distributing assets to its shareholder, to the extent of its accumulated profits, then that will be deemed to be a dividend. So if it is distribution, distributing cash uh, representing its asset, then definitely it is dividend. If it is uh, distributing assets in kind, then market value of that asset will be considered for the purpose. So on what amount do I charge? So in case of assets which are distributed at market value, uh, assets which are distributed in kind, market value will be the value on which I will charge dividend. Yeah. So uh, the next category is when there is distribution of debentures or deposits to shareholders, or there is issue of bonus shares to preference shareholders. Keep this in mind when there is a difference in bonus shares being issued to equity shareholders, bonus shares being issued to preference shareholders. So if a bonus share is issued to a preference shareholder, it is dividend. But if a bonus share is, is issued to an equity shareholder, it is not considered to be a dividend. And it is very specifically provided in the exceptional case. Now, in this case, what would be the amount? So for bonus shares, the market value on the date of issue in the hands of the preference shareholder will be the amount of dividend that will be subject to tax. And in case of debentures, how do you value a debenture? So the uh, accepted value of uh, valuation methods will be the amount which will be deemed dividend in case of debentures. In subsection C, when there is a liquidation of a company and under that liquidation, uh, shareholders are receiving. Now, one thing that needs to be kept in mind in all of this A to E is that the dividend can be taxed only and only to the extent of accumulated profits. So if a company is distributing all this and he has it has accumulated profits, only then that will be considered as dividend in the hands of the shareholder. Yeah, we were on C where we were trying to say that if there is a liquidation of the company and there is distribution on account of that liquidation, again, to the extent of accumulated profits, whatever the shareholders receive by virtue of that liquidation will be deemed dividend subject to tax. 
in subsection C, if there is reduction of capital and against that reduction, I'm offering or I'm giving away something to those shareholders in consideration of that reduction, then again, to the extent of accumulated profits, the, the amount representing the distribution of accumulated profits will be deemed dividend. And the most critical 222E, which all of us uh, face now and then and have have one thing that we check in all our audits is 222E. Now, when is the trigger? So, per se, when I give a loan to anyone that is not dividend, but if I give a loan or advance, and it is applicable only in the case of closely held company. So, a closely held company would be where public is not interested in that company or public is not a shareholder. So, a closely held company who is giving loan to its shareholders and what kind of a shareholder? A shareholder who is holding not less than 10% of the voting power in that particular company. If a loan is advanced to such kind of a shareholder, then it will be deemed dividend in the hands of the shareholder. So uh, the, the income that will have to be offered will be by the shareholder. Similarly, there is another clause which says that if the loan is being given to any other concern where this particular shareholder who is having shares uh, worth more than 10% of the voting power in the company and correspondingly in the concern to whom the loan has been given. If that person holds more than 20% there, if there's a common shareholder who holds this kind of a position, 10% in the company and 20% in the uh, concern, that concern could be anything, could be an HUF, could be a partnership firm, could be another company. So if such kind of loan is given to such concern, then also, the giving the act of giving the loan will be a deemed dividend and it will not be so dividend will not be in the hand of the other concern but in the hand of the shareholder it is by virtue of this shareholder that the amount is getting passed over to the other concern in even in such a scenario the brunt of taxing that income is going to come in the hands of the shareholder and there is a third scenario where they've tried to say that i'm giving uh, such kind of benefit or loan to any other entity uh, but for the benefit of shareholders. So ultimately, it is a shareholder who is getting benefit by virtue of me giving a loan to some other party. Still in such a scenario, deemed dividend will be triggered and the tax will happen in the hands of the shareholder. So this needs to be kept in mind that in such a scenario, the tax is always and always in the hands of the shareholder. Now, what are the exceptions here is that if I'm a company who is into the business of giving loans, and I happen to give a loan to my shareholder by virtue of my business, then such a case will not get covered under the 222E scenario. So something like NBFCs. NBFCs have been uh, taken out of or given an exception to this particular rule. And uh, if I am giving a loan as a trade advance, so say uh, there's a holding company or there's a subsidiary, there's a holding company who's giving a loan to a subsidiary company, but it is for the purpose of the business of uh, that particular subsidiary company, uh, maybe in the nature of advance or maybe in the uh, uh, advancement of uh, the uh, business of the particular subsidiary company, even in that case, uh, there'll be no trigger of 222E. Such trade advances are permitted, but whenever such a scenario comes in, we will have to always see to it that the trade, the, the commercial expediency behind that trade advance is always proved to the uh, department so that uh, you come out of the branch of the uh, 222 e provisions. Now, what are the exceptions to it? Uh, apart from what we've seen in the section, there are a few exceptions given separately. Uh, one is where I am making a distribution to the non-participating uh, non shares, as in those, those shareholders who do not participate in the surplus on the event of liquidation. If I am giving any such distribution to them, then that will not be uh, covered under the ambit of uh, deemed dividend. Next is when I do a buyback of shares where uh, the company offers to the shareholders to buy back those shares, as in they will offer a consideration against which they will buy back the, their own shares and ultimately destroy it. Such a scenario, if that is by virtue of or by the proper provisions of Companies Act, then such a buyback will not get covered. Uh, such a distribution by buyback will not be deemed to be dividend. And if there is a distribution of shares by a resulting company, to the shareholders of a demerger company. So an entity or an undertaking which is getting demerged from an existing company to another company, which is a new company. And the new company comes and issues shares to the shareholders of the existing company by virtue of that undertaking. 
then in such a scenario too, it will not be deemed to be a dividend, uh, deemed dividend. Now, so we saw the kind of categories. Now we'll try and see what are the taxability of all kinds of dividends. So if there's a dividend, like we said, declared by the company in the AGM, in such a scenario, the year in which there is a declaration by the company, that will be the year of taxability. So that will be the year when I will offer dividend to income. Then uh, all the deemed dividend scenarios right from A to D, but keeping E aside, if I am uh, uh, distributing those kind of amounts, then the year in which the distribution happens, my deemed dividend will be taxed in that year in the, hand, in the hands of the shareholder. In the case of 222E, in the year when I advance the loan or payment to such a kind of a shareholder and there's a trigger, it will be that year in which this deemed income uh, will be taxable. And in case of inter in dividend, it's the dividend when the uh, company is unconditionally giving it to the shareholder, that is on the receipt of such kind of shares, uh, receipt of such kind of interim dividend, will the dividend be taxable in that year? Mm -hmm. So uh, these years are relevant for us to understand when the dividend is to be offered to tax in these different scenarios. Now, uh, what will be the permissible deductions for me against the dividend income? Now, section 57 is the section which will give you the kind of deduction that is allowed. So uh, subsection one tells me that some kind of commission or some kind of expenses which I incur uh, to realize this income from the banker, if I have incurred those kind of expenses, I'll be able to uh, take a deduction of those kind of expenses. Now, if we if uh, we must have read section fifty seven subsection three, it says that expenses which are incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of earning that income, then they'll be allowed for deduction against that income. Now, this is a very plain language which says that okay, if I have in, if I if interest has been, I'm taking an example of interest right now, if interest has been incurred to earn that dividend income, I would like to take a deduction of that interest against my dividend income. But what happens is there's a proviso to the whole of section 57. If you see the placement of that proviso, it applies to the whole of 57. And by virtue of that, the proviso is trying to restrict the amount of interest expenditure, which I can claim, which means the section tells me that only 20% of my dividend income, uh, only the amount determined to the extent of 20% of my dividend income is the amount that I'll be allowed as an interest expenditure. So even though 57.3 allows me the whole of the amount, but proviso which applies to the whole of 57 will only allow me 20%. So when I'm offering uh, dividend income under the head EFOS, then in that case, only 20% of interest ex expenses allowed to me. Now, uh, apart from that, the proviso additionally says that no other deduction shall be allowed to me. It will be only the first one, uh, commission or remuneration to realize that income. 20% of the interest uh, income to the extent of dividend, to the extent of 20% of dividend. And the third will be no other deduction. So this is the limited category of deductions which 57 is trying to allow me. Now, let us take a scenario where a uh, dividend is earned from shares, obviously. But that shares are either held by us as investment and there are certain category of people who hold their shares as stock and trade. Stock and trade as in, they are people who deal in day in, day out in those kind of shares. I and mean, shares is like a commodity to them. And uh, they do a trading on a daily basis on those shares with their perspective to earn profit. But while they are holding those shares in a, maybe for a day or a few days, then in those days, they earn dividend from such kind of income, whether it will still be an EFOS income for them or business income for them. Now, why does it matter? Someone would think hey, yaar, dono ka rate is the same, right? It's going to be taxed tax at the slab rate or 30% or whatever rate it is. So what difference does it make to see whether it is a business income or an EFOS income? Why it is relevant are two, three reasons. One is, say, if you have an unabsorbed loss, business loss, uh, which is brought forward from earlier years. And if I can try and classify my dividend income as business income, then in that case, this will be helpful. Then there are scenarios where I have tax holidays or tax exemptions based on my business income. Sections could be 10A, 10AA. 10 and if I can try and see that my, uh, uh, my dividend income qualifies to be a business income, 
then any such income uh, can be offered for uh, can be claimed as a tax exemption and I might not have to shell out that tax on the dividend income. And right now we spoke about the interest expenditure under 57, uh, which restricts 20% of the dividend income. Now, if I have an interest expenditure, which is much more higher, I mean, say, for example, uh, to invest or to put money into that shares, I have uh, taken some borrowings and the income that I earn is not sufficient to cover my interest amount. What will happen is if I go under the head business income, 37 will give me a wide coverage as to uh, as to uh, allow me to claim a higher amount of interest. If I do, if I go under 57, I will my interest expense might go waste. But under 37, I can always try and claim that this was an expenditure incurred for the purpose of earning business income. So these are a few reasons where we should try and see whether it is possible for me to classify or not. Now, if we go by the wordings of section 57, if you see. Uh, to a lot many income, there are a lot many incomes defined which are, which could be a part of any other head of income as well. Now it could be dividend, it could be interest income. Now for interest income, say for example, uh, under the head EFOS, they have used that if that interest income is not chargeable under PGPP, then you come to this this section, which means there is a possibility of this income going into the other head also. Now, no same wordings have been used for dividend income. Dividend income is simply stated as dividend. They do not use the words whether it is, uh, if you're charging it under PGPP, then you cannot charge it under EFOS and you can go there. But no similar words have been used. And hence, there is a question whether uh, a person for whom this really is a share uh, held as stock in trade and it's not an investment, can he try and claim the dividend income one view could be that the intention of the legislature was not to take that dividend income by virtue of carrying out business activities. And hence, if it were an intention, it would have definitely mentioned something like this, even for dividend income. But let us see, are there any judgments or is there any leeway under the law where I can try and still uh, qualify it as a business income? So uh, despite this language, there are a few judgments. Now, again, uh, every dividend income will have to be decided on a case-to-case -case basis. This is not the finality of it. So whatever uh, your memorandum of association, your, your business activity, how is it defined, your regularity of carrying out those activities, a lot many factors come into play. But if we can try and establish that, these judgments might help us out. So uh, there is, there are judgments of, there's a Supreme Court judgment. This is under the old law of 1922 Act, but uh, because it's a, a law led by the Supreme Court on principles, we can rely upon it. Wherein what had happened was, um, there were, uh, uh, the assessee was into uh, uh, share trading business and certain shares was held as stock in trade. It had brought forward losses, but even in that act, the income was offered under the head EFOS. So the SSE had tried and claimed that uh, saying that uh, doing business in stock and trade is my uh, is my business and business activity. And hence, any income even incidental to that should be allowed for set off. So uh, the Supreme Court had held that the broad forward business loss will be allowed as uh, allowed for a set off against the dividend income, even though offered under the head EFOS. Then uh, the next is group bond which was uh, again a Supreme Court judgment where the uh, judgment is trying to say that even if you are offering the dividend income under their head EFOS, the very basis or the very nature of the income just because you are showing it as EFOS will not decide whether it is EFOS. So my underlying activity, whether it is business in nature or investment in, in nature, uh, what is the intention with which these shares were held? All these factors will have to be kept in mind. And hence, if you read, it says it must be determined from the evidence whether having regard to true nature and character of income, it can be described. So just by form is not sufficient. I will have to truly go and check the substance behind it, the, the character or the nature of the activity that I'm carrying out. And if I can prove it's a business income, then definitely, yes, I will be able to uh, take it as business income. Then again, uh, another uh, Mumbai Tribunal decision where uh, us, again an investment entity who held shares as uh, shares as a part of stock and trade, dividend on such shares were uh, allowed to be taken or considered as business income. 
then uh, we had another Delhi uh, tribunal, I think, decision uh, where again shares were held as stock in trade, and again the question was was a set off where it was permitted. So by and large, we can see that though the language of uh, the section does not permit you to or does not it does not permit but it does not disallow also it does not restrict you also some courts have interpreted that uh, if you are earning dividend from stock and trade then you will be able to claim that as a uh, set off against your business income or it could also be a possibility where you are uh, having loss under that particular ethos wherein dividend income is certain uh, say uh, dividend income is say 100 rupees per i'm just taking an example and your interest expenditure against that is 120. So I have a loss under uh, uh, dividend income to the extent of 20. And if I can prove that dividend is by virtue of that business income, I will be able to claim that against my business profits. Now what, so this we discussed for those entities where the shares were held as stock trade. What in case of entities who are holding shares of their group entities or subsidiaries, which are strategic in nature, strategic in the sense uh, there are a lot of times where I make an investment into my group entity uh, from a business angle perspective, or maybe I make an investment in my subsidiary uh, to, an, uh, to help out to do an expansion of the business. Whether in such a scenario, also can someone try and say that though it is classified as investment in my balance sheet, but my, my true nature of that investment is ultimately going to help me in my own business. So uh, we have a decision of the Chennai uh, uh, High Court, which says that um, there were some investments made in one of the entities where this particular company had a controlling interest. And by virtue of that investment, the entity earned dividend income. Now that, that, that interest or that strategic investment could be many reasons, you know, uh, helping in the business of the subsidy, helping in my business, expansion of the existing business or maybe a procurement of raw material, n number of reasons. If that commercial expediency has been established, then the uh, the high court has held that, yes, in that case too, your dividend income is by virtue of business activity only and any such dividend earned from business income will definitely be a business income. Uh, any such dividend earned by such investment, strategic investment will be a business income and will be allowed uh, to be set off uh, against brought forward business losses. Yeah. Now, uh, so by and large, every fact has to be seen in every case and are accordingly decided. The next one is, uh, we all know there is a provision of ATM where uh, say I am receiving dividend from one company. I'm a, this, and mind you, this applies only to a company because ATM section deduction is allowed only to a company. So I say I am a company which earns dividend from another company and down the line, I issue dividend to my other shareholders. Now, uh, what I will do is whatever dividend I have earned, I will try and claim a deduction of ATM for the dividend that I have passed over to my shareholders. Now, in this scenario, uh, assuming that I have a 100 rupee dividend earned and I am passing over 80 below. Okay, So the net income is 20. Now, while calculating the deduction of interest, I might have incurred some borrowing cost also, which is in the form of interest. So while deducting this 20% of uh, interest deduction, what will be the amount? Should it be the amount of gross dividend or it should be the amount uh, after taking the net amount uh, in the sense that after taking the deduction of ATM? So should it be on 100? Should that 20% be calculated on 100 or should that 20% be calculated on the net amount of 180, which is 20% on the 20 rupee? Now, why this confusion is uh, because of the wordings that are used under 57. Now, 57 states that 20% of the dividend income that is included in total income. Now, how is total income calculated? Like we generally do, I have all my incomes under all the heads. I derive at a gross total income. I do take my chapter 6 a deduction. And then I derive at a total income. Now, because of this wordings, there is an issue why this confusion has been created. But by going by the mechanism as to how this whole calculation will happen, 56 and 57 fall under one chapter only. And for me to come to a gross total income, I need to first determine my income and then determine whatever deductible expenses are there. 
whatever that net figure is, that will form a part of my gross total income. And only then will I apply chapter 6A deduction. So going by this computation mechanism that has been provided and going by the order uh, as to how the income has to be derived, this seems to be an appropriate method where what I will do first is I will take the dividend income, uh, 100 rupees. Say I have a 5 rupee, I will calculate 20% of my interest income, uh, interest expenditure. I will deduct that. Whatever is the net income from that, I will try and reduce my ATM deduction of the uh, uh, dividend that I have passed over to my shareholders. So this seems to be an appropriate uh, uh, interpretation right now. Now, uh, what are the precautions that we need to keep in mind while filing? Uh, see, a lot of times our assessees are investing amounts into certain mutual funds where they have a dividend reinvestment schemes. So in case of a dividend reinvestment scheme, no amount is credited. We generally tend to have a habit that we remove the bank statement, try and uh, remove interest amount, dividend amount, and try and put it in the EFOS ledger, uh, in, in, under the head EFOS. But there are times when mutual fund does a reinvestment of those particular dividend, and you will not come to know because the amount has never got credited to the bank. So in that case, always try and check your 26 AS or AIS report. Even call for mutual fund documents from your client and only then a cross check will help you to understand whether you have taken all interest amount or not. Similarly, a lot many times in the bank, we have only the net figure coming in. Say 100 rupees is my dividend income. The company has deducted 10 and uh, 10 of TDS amount and the net 90 rupees has been credited to my bank account. What I will try and do is the moment he gives me his bank statements, I'm going to take 90 as my dividend income and put it in the EFOS. Now, in this scenario, always try and check and reconcile with your 26 years in AIS because that will let you know that your actual income is not 90, but 100. And you might offer less income. So always try and reconcile that. And the next one is that uh, I have been given under that EFOS chapter, I have been given a table where I need to report the quarterly uh, amounts that I have earned for the dividend income. The reason being, they want to try and uh, see that if you have earned dividend, maybe not in the first or the second or the third quarter, then they might charge you interest accordingly. So always try and uh, uh, segregate it rightly and put the information correctly so that unnecessary interest is not charged on you. So these are a few precautions that we need to keep in mind when we, uh, uh, when we uh, compute the dividend income under the head EFOS. Yeah, the next one is uh, winning from lotteries. Uh, all of us know that uh, there are a lot of winnings in the form of lotteries or puzzles, some kind of online games, some kind of uh, uh, winnings that happen, maybe could be gambling, could be betting and all that. Now, this is a category again, which falls under none of the heads, but e -force. But it is taxed at a special rate of 30% under section 115 uh, BB. Now, one might wonder why a special rate? The whole purpose, whenever government wants to levy a high rate, one of the purpose always is to discourage or disincentivize, uh, disincentivize those people who are earning money this way. You know, So the whole reason of 30% is this. Now, what are the other implications when I earn an income from such kind of uh, uh, winnings? Now, here I have tried to cover uh, lottery, crossword puzzles and games and all. There is another slide where I will cover horse race separately because the taxation is a little different there. And there is another slide where uh, I will be covering online gaming because and I'm sure everyone must be aware of the buzz that has got created against this online gaming thing right now. So we'll come to it separately. Uh, right now, just focusing on lotteries, when I have such kind of income, special rate tax at 30%. Keep this in mind, your gross income will be taxable. So even if you have incurred any expenditure, no deduction or no allowance will be allowed to you under this head. Your gross income is getting taxable. So even if you are not earning income, but your gross income will be subject to tax. Then uh, to further uh, discourage what they've done is they have not permitted any chapter 6 disallowance. So for uh, uh, chapter 6 deduction, sorry. So in case you have uh, this income plus other income and the other income is not sufficient to uh, take care of the 6 deductions, you will still not be allowed to claim any 6 deduction against this particular income. 
then if you have incurred a loss like we just spoke there could be a scenario where you your expenditure for earning this income is more than the revenue that you have earned from this particular income then even if you have such kind of loss there will be no set off of loss no carry forward of such kind of loss further if this is the only income under the head efors for you or maybe in the whole of your computation you will still not be allowed as an individual or an actuary you will still not be allowed to claim the benefit of the basic exemption limit so no exhaustion of basic exemption limit under this particular head of income under this particular income nature now coming to horse races again it is covered under the same efors under the same section at special rate of 30% but if you are into a business of maintaining uh it's not winning actually it is maintaining if you are a person who owns and maintains horses for races then in such a scenario you will be allowed to be taxed on the net income so whatever income or uh, whatever expense you are incurring to maintain those horses so that they be eligible for races then in that case the net income will be the amount on which you will be paying taxes but at 30% only now uh this winning of horses or this uh, maintaining of horses should be obviously under the permitted lawful business of doing horse races matlab it should not be illegal it should be legally permitted that horse races should be allowed and if you are maintaining those kind of horses only then you will be able to come into this ambit uh again uh, like we said for lottery there is no deduction under chapter 6a there is no exhaustion of basic exemption limit against this income but if you are incurring any loss by virtue where your expenditure is more than the income for maintaining and owning those horses for these races then you will be allowed to claim that loss as a set off only and only if you are having income from some other uh, horse income so if you have income from other sources uh, it could be interest dividend it could be pgvp or something it is not allowed it is clearly and clearly of the same source of income and if suppose in a particular year you are not allowed to take it forward or you're not allowed to uh, you're not uh, being able to absorb it then for a period of 4 years you will be allowed to carry forward this loss with the condition that if you have a future income under the same source which is from owning and maintaining of horses if you have income in future only and only in that case you will be allowed to take a set off now uh coming to the uh, uh very trending and the very buzz right now on the online gaming thing uh we know that a lot of uh, governments are against this online gaming the craze among the young young millennials is too high and uh, somewhere the government is right maybe to discourage such kind of uh, 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 ways of earning income so uh, a lot of buzz has been created dream 11 being one of the very famous uh, entities or platforms it, it is rummy poker also and there are many such platforms which uh, maybe on a computer or maybe on your mobile handset as well you are able to play it with a click so uh, in the case of lotteries and all it is a, it could be lottery it could be gaming it could be betting it is a common understanding that these all games are games of chance okay game of chance as in you don't have to apply any of your special skill you don't have to uh, put in effort you don't have to uh, plan or strategize things it's just a random event and such kind of events are termed uh, if you win in such kind of event then it is termed that you are lucky that you have won okay so uh, that is generally referred to as the term game of chance so you know the Uh, i have listed a few points like happening of a random event then the player has no say in the game the it's there is no mental ability uh, of uh, which the player has to put in no efforts and it's just by a uh, luck so could be that i am throwing a dice and i was lucky that i wanted that number I, and i won maybe i am playing cards and i was lucky i got those cards and i won uh, these kind of games are generally covered under uh, a game of chance now uh, there could be a few games where uh individually i might plan i might so i might uh, with myself or maybe a a, a, a team made up of a team plays you know the a a group of people a group of team a group of league who come together we have such uh, competitions happening 
so these people come together what they will do is uh, they will they will try and gain knowledge on that particular gaming they will try and take trainings they will try and strategize they will try and plan as to how we will play that game and apply that and after a group effort or maybe an individual effort or after a proper application of mind there's a chance i might win such kind of games are uh, can be bifurcated or can be segregated from a uh, game of chance to game of skill so wherever i am putting that human effort or that specialized uh, planning or strategy those could be game of skill now in that case there is a difference between the two the game of chance is without any effort just by luck and game of skill is where i have to strategize it so dream 11 or maybe the fantasy thing or all these kind of platforms they are trying to argue that when a participant comes on my platform he is not winning randomly it is not by luck it is by virtue of him putting in effort so for those kind of people can a game of skill be considered as business income or even if it is not considered as business income if it is a one off can it be still an efos but out of the ambit of 115bb now once i am what is the benefit once i am out of that game of chance once i am once i am out of that ambit of 115bb i will always try and say that i will not be subject to special rate of tax i will come under the normal slab i will be able to claim expenses and i will be able to take all those benefits which 115 bb is denying me which is like a six day deduction or maybe claim of expenditure claim of basic exemption limit so at this point in time bifurcating or distinguishing between a game of chance and game of skill becomes very important now this needs to be kept in mind that such kind of decisions uh, have come around we know gst a lot of decisions are been coming up and coming up on this so uh, the government has realized that okay there is some leeway which people have found out so from financial year 23 24 onwards the budget the finance act 23 has given us a new provision 115 bbj where such kind of online gaming now online gaming covering they've defined online gaming to be a gaming on the computer systems and all they have not tried to bifurcate into game of chance or game of skill under this particular section new section which means where i was trying to find a leeway to come out of the provision of that special rate the government again has imposed on me that 30% rate by bringing in a new provision where there is no bifurcation between game of chance or game of skill but at least for this year i can still try and see whether i can fit into the business income or not so let us see if there are a few judgments on that which i have covered on the next slide yeah so dream 11 like we spoke uh, these are mostly judgments all surrounding the gst provisions but the principles can very well be applied and tried and clean that you know when uh, i can prove that it is a game of skill that means i am putting in some effort and the head business or profession should definitely be given to me so uh, one was punjab and haryana high court where uh, in 2017 a case was taken up uh where dream 11 had tried to say that you know i am not a game of chance i have users coming to my platform who put in knowledge who put in uh effort who put who strategize who plan so predominantly they are doing something and hence it cannot be a game of chance where there is gambling possible now there was an slp which was filed uh, against this so high court had given this judgment in favor of the uh, uh, assessee uh, saying that yes it is a game of skill but the department had got into an appeal and filed an slp which got dismissed which means this uh, high court judgment remains then again on a similar uh, footing a bombay high court judgment uh, has been rendered in the case of uh, gurdeep singh sachar jahan pe uh, slp again which was filed uh, against the favorable judgment of uh, bombay high court was dismissed which means bombay high court prevails and it is trying to again try and distinguish dream 11 to say that no it is not a game of gambling or betting and hence uh, it will be a, a classified as a game of skill so uh, even under the gst there is a bias as to what rate should apply obviously the gst council has come up with a different rate right now but prior to that these were the judgments then uh, similar judgment uh, in the case of ravi singh choudhary choudhary in 2020 where the similar judgment has been uh, uh, given so Uh, there could be some games where uh, or some platforms where there could be an element of both game of chance as well as game of skill in a particular single game itself 
Now, in that case, what would be the scenario? Time will tell us. But this cannot be taken as a, a, a final verdict. Every every particular case will have to be checked on a case to case basis. Now, uh, winning of prize money. Uh, okay, so this was a case. Uh, what had happened was there was a person who used to who had a who had a a, a business of selling lottery tickets to people. So uh, someday what happened was there were some unsold lottery tickets with him. So generally for a person like him, the lottery tickets are uh, his products, his goods, and he will recognize them as stock and trade. Okay. So, and whatever uh, profits that he earned by selling and purchasing these lottery tickets, he's going to offer that as business income. But what happened one day was that he happened to, uh, unable, he was unable to sell all the lottery tickets and there were certain remaining as in stock and trade. Now, out of that stock of lottery of tickets, he was lucky enough that the draw that was drawn was from one of the lottery tickets that he had in his stock and trade and he won a prize. What did he contend was that uh, I had these kept as stock and trade and hence even the prize that I have won should not be under the special rate of 115 BB. It should be as a business income because I am into the business of purchasing and selling. What the Kerala High Court has held that okay, the moment or the day you had that unsold lottery tickets and the day the draw was announced, that was no more a stock and trade for you. It was now as if you were holding it as a participant. The day you won it, the day there was a draw, you are now a participant and not a person who holds it for sale. And because the nature has changed, this will not be a business income. You have actually won a lottery. And hence, by virtue, even though by virtue of you holding it as an unsold lottery ticket, but you become your role from a business person changes to a person who has invested into a lottery ticket. And hence, the income earned will not be business income. It will be EFOS and it will be subject to special rate of tax. So, uh, same time, maybe not same nature of income, but in a different scenario, different type of incomes to the same person. Now, again, similar to what has been given under the head dividend, I have been given, uh, see, unlike my advance tax for other income, I can always try and predict okay, uh, on an estimation basis what will be my income in the particular quarters. But these are those unique incomes or one-off income which I'm not in a position to and that is how the law has allowed me to make notify them that it was in which quarter I was uh, that I have earned this income. And hence, similar to dividend income, there has been a bifurcation given under the ITR itself, where you can try and say under which quarter uh, you have earned this income. Try and appropriate it in the right quarter so that you don't have to face the hazard of interest for the previous quarters, where this income was not earned. Yeah, so we saw dividend income, we saw... Uh, 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 lottery income, online gaming income, we saw uh, horse racing income. Now, I've picked up each and every head, so let's go by it. So, uh, employee contribution. Now, everyone knows that uh, whenever I am, there are two types of contributions uh, in case of an employer-employee towards PF or maybe other fund, other recognized funds. One is the employer contribution, which is very well covered under 43. Now, the other one is an employee contribution. Now, the moment you deduct that contribution from the salary of his employee, of this employee, and before making the payment to the provident fund, it is income in the hand of the employer. Okay. And the moment you make or that payment to that particular provident fund account is the time you are out of deduction. So it is not automatic, it is not implied. It is only when you have earned, you earn the income when you deduct that from the employee and you get a deduction of as an expenditure when you make a payment to the provident fund on his behalf. Now, if say, suppose I uh, have deducted from his salary, but I have further not made a payment to the respective provident fund within the prescribed unit, that is another relevant factor. Then in that case, it will be income in the hands of the employer. So it is here trying to say that if it is income under the head PGBP, okay, it will go there. But if there's a scenario where PGBP income is not triggered and the scenario is still there where I have deducted and I have not paid to the respective fund house within the prescribed due date, then in that scenario, I will uh, uh, try, I will have to offer it as income from other sources. 
So similar to what we saw in business and profession, if it does not qualify there, it will come here. So uh, yes, this is employee contribution, not uh, deducted, but not paid to the uh, fund house within the prescribed period. Then uh, interest income on securities. So uh, like we saw that uh, uh, investments could be, I mean, uh, securities could be held as investments, securities could be held as stock and trade or for various business purposes like strategic investments. If I am similar to dividend, if I am earning interest income on such securities, and if they are not my stock and trade or they do not qualify to be under the business head, then it will be offered under the head EFOS. And uh, what will be the deductions allowed here? The deductions will be similar to dividend, but there is no restriction of 20% of interest expenditure that I have uh, in case of dividend. So I will get commission or whatever expenses I incur to earn this income. And if uh, I have borrowed money, then made put that money into the security, then, then I'm paying interest on that borrowed money. I'm earning interest on the income income, uh, interest uh, I'm in, uh, earning interest on these securities, then I'll be able to claim an expenditure against this interest income. Now, uh, can, can, so this was in terms of interest on securities. Now, there could be other interests. There are a lot many categories of interest income, which uh, could be apart from securities, could be loan, could be deposits, could be uh, bank, uh, 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 interest on banks, banks on refunds and all. Now, can there be certain category of income which could qualify as business income and not E4? So there are a few judgments. Let us try and understand what was the facts of this judgment and in that scenario, what was held? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this is a judgment of uh, low holdings wherein what had happened was uh, the entity was in the business of developing properties and uh, by so say real estate and by virtue of that it had earned certain advance money from customers now maybe at that point in time that that business entity did not need that fund so what it did was it temporarily parked those kind of funds uh, in in banks or maybe in deposits or short term funds and all the question was what interest i'm earning on those kind of incomes which is not otherwise presently used for the business but incidental to the business can that be under the head EFOS or business income? So the court has held that, yes, it would be business income. Then the reason being the very source was my business funds remaining idle, which were temporarily parked because it was not in use. So in that case, I will, my connection, my nexus is with the business. Uh, my, my advance from customers was my business activity and my idle funds are in connection with that. And hence, it will be a, a business in nature and hence business income. The next scenario was uh, Indo-Swiss where uh, we had a few, we had an assessee who was uh, trying to import some kind of machinery for his business. Now that machinery was taking some time so and it had arranged for funds already. What it thought was let me put these funds in short term deposits uh, and whenever there will be a need for me to make the payment, I will try and make the payment. So in that case, the temporary funds in which I had uh, parked my money it fetched me interest income. So what would be the nature? Again, the same uh, 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 logic was applied here where it was tried and said that my ultimate purpose was to use it for a, an apparatus which was which I was going to use in my business. And it was just a temporary uh, funds which I had kept ideal and hence to make the best utilization of it, I had kept it into uh, 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 deposits. And hence any income that I'm earning from by virtue of this will also be a business income not to be treated as e -force. Now, see, we have a lot of many judgments. There could be some judgment also, which in the similar scenario must have held as e -force, but we'll have to try and see under which jurisdiction and what facts uh, can we try and relate uh, with that judge, uh, facts of that judgment. Then, um, then there was a case of uh, Sri Krishna Polyster where uh, the company had got in money by virtue of issue of public share, uh, by virtue of issue of shares. And what it did was it didn't require that money immediately. It tried and deposit those money in the bank deposits. So the income of interest earned from that bank deposits, what would be the nature? Here the court has held that see, the very nature or the very source from which this particular uh, income has been earned or the, the very source of the monies that have come from which this income has come that is from public issue of shares and hence not business income take doing 
issuing a share, public issue, doing a public issue of shares or issuing shares is not your business activity. Hence, the source is not business activity and hence income that you have uh, kept in the deposits which have come by virtue of this will not be business income and hence it will default. Yeah. Uh, then we have the case of uh, JP DSC Ventures where what had happened was uh, this was an entity who was awarded a contract and by virtue of that contract, by the conditions of that contract, by, there was a requirement of a performance guarantee where certain amounts were to be kept as a guarantee in the FD. Now, in this case, that FD earned me a freshly interest income. What would be the nature? Again, here, the court is trying to say that this this uh, compulsion of keeping an FD was not your own decision. It was by virtue of a compulsion to keep that particular contract uh, light, to keep that uh, particular contract running. And hence, whatever income you earn on this funds, which have been kept as a guarantee, will also be connected or will have a nexus with the business. Uh, and hence, it will be business in nature. Again, this was not taxed as income from other sources. Then we have a judgment of uh, uh, international marketing uh, where what has happened is, uh, yeah, so uh, the company had not commenced with his business and till the time it had uh, not started with business activities or not carried out any business per se, what it did was it parked these uh, amounts in a few different other companies and earned uh, interest income in that nature. Now, here also, the court is trying to say that your nexus is not there with the business activity and hence, whatever income you're going to be earning uh, by virtue of putting those monies in those companies, it will not be in the nature of business and hence default. Now, uh, we have a decision of Bokaro Steel uh, of Supreme Court uh, where what was happening is certain advances were made to a contractor uh, for construction of a particular capital asset. And by virtue of those advances, there was some interest income earned by Bokaro Steel. So what treatment needs to be given in that case was uh, the Supreme Court held that because a capital asset uh, is coming uh, in, into place, you know, capital asset is getting constructed and uh, the advance is by virtue of that advance given to such kind of a contractor. What you can do here is it will not be taxed as any income. It would not be taxed as ethos. It would not be taxed as business income. What the court allowed was you can try and reduce the uh, cost of construction by virtue of this interest income. Now, uh, under the ICDS, when the ICDS, Income Computation and Disclosure Standards, when this was brought in, what had happened was uh, initially ICDS specified that under the head borrowing cost, we have an ICDS 9 under the head borrowing cost, where it was specified that if uh, you have borrowed money for uh, getting an asset into play, uh, say some fixed asset or any asset which will help me in my business for the construction or for its acquisition, then if that if those borrowings are temporarily parked somewhere, then in that scenario, what you will do is you will offer it as income in place of deducting it from the cost of construction. Now, this was uh, when ICDS was challenged by in the Delhi High Court, this particular provision was struck down and no new law has been bought by the uh, uh, legislative legislature till date. And hence the principle of Bokaro still remains, wherein we are trying to say that uh, if there is construction of an asset or an acquisition of asset, and those borrowings for uh, which have been temporarily parked somewhere, if I'm earning interest income, it can still be reduced from the cost of construction and it will not be required to be offered as it was. So these are a few judgments. Again, going to the fact that every case will have to be tested on a factual basis. Every case will be different and we'll have to test it out what head we can take it into. So these are uh, based on whatever judgments, these are a few principles and if we go by the principles, it's, it comes out with a common principle that uh, the source of the money from which that money has come, if that pertains to business and if the need is a temporary, uh, so there are certain scenarios where uh, let's say the first principle which says that 
uh, it was by virtue that my customers had given me money and that money I didn't need for the temporary basis. Then it has a connection with business. It will be business income. Then we saw a scenario where there was a performance guarantee. Again, that was connected with business income and hence can be taken under the head business. Then, uh, then we saw a scenario where the business only had not started. It was a pre-construction period. So if you have a scenario where there was no business activity, there is still the business being set up. Then in that scenario, it will have to be offered as uh, income from other sources. If you have a scenario where the money is coming from issue of capital uh, or it is getting utilized for some construction of project, then it will be uh, either income from sources. And if it is uh, used for acquisition of a uh, or uh, construction of an asset, then it will be reduced from the cost. So uh, just a principles laid down, but uh, scenario to scenario, we'll have to test it out. So this is what we saw in terms of interest income. Uh, then the next head is uh, renting. Now we know that we have a head called house property income, where uh, if there is, if I'm the owner of a particular building, then letting out on that building will get uh, uh, taking care under the head house property. But there are certain assets like plant, machinery, furniture, which I might be uh, giving on rent. Now, there can be two scenarios. Either I am into the business of uh, letting that, uh, uh, either I am into the business of renting or I am just letting the plant and machinery as a one-off. If I am into the business of it and if I can prove that it's my business activity, then no brainer, it will go under the PGVP head. But if it is not the scenario, then it will be taxed under the head EFOS. And what will be the permissible deductions against this? So the law has said that what I was otherwise allowing under PGPP, I will allow all those kind of expenditures against this. Now in this one more addition that they've done is that if there's a building, uh, so while I'm letting out plant, machinery and furniture, and there is some building which is inseparable from this plant and machinery, and I have to let out that building also, in that scenario also, it will be income from other sources. The deductions, what will be allowed will be repairs to the buildings, insurance premium that I have paid, repairs uh, uh, and insurance again to the plant and machinery, depreciation uh, under the head PGVP, I was allowed uh, to take the expenditure or the allowance of the wear and tear of the asset. Similar thing has been allowed to me under uh, the head EFOS as well. And apart from these, if there are any other expenditure which I can prove have been incurred to on this income, I'll be able to claim those expenditures. Then uh, key man insurance policy, a very common expenditure that we have uh, for businesses. So uh, if there is any income coming on maybe maturity, surrender, or maybe on the death of the key man person, then such kind of income uh, if it is received by a person, so that generally it is the, we understand the employer for whom a, uh, a, uh, an employee is a key man. And in order to, uh, if the, suddenly something happens to that key man, then, then that particular employer will be at loss. And to, to create a hedge for that loss, he has taken that key man insurance policy. Now, it is not only necessary that I as an employer might take that key man policy only if I have an employee. There could be a possibility that I'm dealing with some other contractor. There could be a possibility of dealing with some person, professional consultant, whoever, who is really important to me for my business, who is giving me services. And if suddenly something happens, I will try and uh, take a key man insurance policy even for that person. So need not be an em uh, employer, employee. Uh, only for an employer, it could be some other person also. So if such an amount is received on maturity, surrender, or maybe death, but if it is received by a person who is not the employer or not the person who has taken this policy, if it is received by some other person, in that case, it will be taxable under the head e -force. And uh, say it is uh, assigned, the employer thinks that, okay, the tenure of the employee or that person has come to an end and I want to assign this policy to him then the person in whose name this policy has been taken it can be taken the it can be assigned to him and in that case the amount will come to him so by virtue of that even when the amounts come to him under this policy it will be taxed under the head force then uh, uh, any kind of uh, compensation so there could be uh, various ways in which i would be offered compensation uh, could be some terms which were not fulfilled during a contract and someone offered me compensation. It could be 
compulsory acquisition by the government, there could be some kind of compensation. Now, if there is a, a delay where uh, in getting that compensation or that enhanced compensation by way of an interest income, so the such kind of income does not get covered under any other head and will come under e force Now, generally, even for people uh, who, so section 145b says that uh, irrespective of the method of accounting followed, because if you are a person who follows cash, you are a person who follows mercantile system of accounting. If you are earning an income by way of interest on such compensation, it will be taxed only in the year in which it is received. The And this is a very welcome thing because uh, you never know when this will be awarded to you. Uh, so even if it is declared by a verdict that you are eligible for an interest, the receipt of it is not known. And hence, by virtue of that, uh, the year of receipt will be the year in which uh, interest is going to be received. Uh, it will be taxable. Now here, there is a standard deduction. So by virtue of 57 provision, they have said that 50% straightforward, we are going to give you a deduction under against this interest earned on the compensation amount. It's not 50% of compensation, it's 50% of the interest on compensation. And you cannot claim any other expenditure. So just like we have standard deduction under salary, this is a similar thing where we have a standard deduction of 50%. Yeah. Uh, Next is amount forfeited. So say I am, I have agreed or I have got into an agreement with another person to buy a particular asset. Mind you, it has to be a capital asset and I have given him advance. Now, after certain uh, time, maybe uh, or due to some negotiations, we are not going ahead with that kind of a transaction. And the term require me to give away that advance. There is no possibility of me recovering that advance, nor by virtue of that negotiation, I'm taking the asset also. So any such amount, if I am receiving as an advance, say I'm the person who has agreed to give an asset and now I'm uh, ter uh, terminating that and the other parties also agreed, whatever advance I have received will be offered as income from other sources. Then family pension, uh, any income, which is received. So family pension only in the case of a death of a person. If it is received by the legal hire and that legal hire is uh, uh, receiving it from the employer of the person who has died, in that case, then family pension gets taxed under recourse. Now that family pension has been defined to be uh, an amount which there, where there is a monthly payment given by the employer to the legal hire of the employer. Uh, one third of the pension amount or 15,000, whichever is lower is the amount that is allowed as a deduction income. So this net amount will be taxed as income from other sources. Now, uh, if uh, the next head would be compensation or payment received in connection with termination of employment of any person, if it is not considered under the head salary for whatever reason, uh, say my employment has got over and there is some kind of compensation which I have received later on, such kind of income will also be covered under the head because. Now, this was all those incomes uh, that are specified under the section 56. Yes, I know there are there is 56 to 10 also, which I have covered separately. And there is 56 to 7B for issue of shares, which have been covered specifically under the other slide. Those are specified income. But now for a time being, let's come to certain incomes which have not been defined uh, under the section 56 subsection 2, but still can be a part of my EFOS head and what are those kind of income? So income from subletting of a house property by a tenant. Now, by virtue of him being a tenant, he is not, he doesn't, he only has a right to occupy. He does not have a right to sublet. And hence, because he does not have a right to sublet, it will not fall under the nature of a letting out of a house property under the head HP. And hence, if it has been sublet by a tenant, then it will come under this head. So casual income could be any income. There could be like we discussed earlier that no head which remains uh, previously, all those kind of income will remain under the head, will be taxed under the residuary category and a casual income could be something like a tuition fee, uh, some, some income which I'm earning from my other source of income, uh, one-off one -off transaction of a consultancy charges which I'm not otherwise regularly doing could come under this. Insurance commission, I, if commission is not my business and uh, doing insur giving insurance policies is not my business, then insurance commission, one-off can come here. 
then director sitting for attending board meetings now there are directors who are not into the executionary capacity and when they are not into the executionary capacity they are not into an employer employee relationship with the company so any kind of activity not falling under the ambits will uh, be uh, covered under efos and director sitting fees is one such uh, 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 income where i am not doing uh, attend managing the whole business right now i'm just attending the board meeting and it will be efos uh for that matter even commission earned by a director uh, not connected to the business will definitely come under this head then we have interest on bank deposits uh, which is like having a savings bank account and earning interest on that which will come under this and ultimately uh, subject to the limit specified for individual hf uh, you will have a deduction under ebtda as well then uh, deposits with the company deposits could be in the nature of bonds it could be in the nature of ncds any such uh amount that i have kept with other companies who's giving me who is servicing them in the form of interest such kind of interest will come under the head uh efos then there is interest on loan so uh any uh, individual or maybe any entity who is not sorry not into the business of uh, lending any interest earned on such uh, amounts given as loan will be an interest income under the head efos now income from undisclosed sources what could this be so we have section 68 cash credit we have section 69 various sections where we have unex unexplained expenditure unexplained investment unexplained money found so these are all those kind of income where i do not know what is the source from which i have derived it so this could be either voluntarily where i as an ssc have offered it voluntarily in my income tax return either it could be found later on where the ao has opened your assessment and he's try to tax that so all these kind of income voluntarily or not will fall under the head because again uh, subject to special rate of tax then uh, remuneration from the member of parliament again there is no employer employee relationship he is just serving there by being a member of the parliament attending to the uh, uh, what do you say uh, attending to those uh, uh, matters there and any remuneration received by him by virtue or by capacity of that will be an impost uh interest on securities of foreign government a part of this now there are a lot many other income uh, under the head or under the section 115a which where foreign companies and non residents are tax could be dividend could be royalty could be interest all co get covered and there is a specific heading under the idr where i will have to specify and put it in the respective head covered under efos then uh examination fees received by a teacher from an institution who is not an employer so i could be a teacher with a particular college but uh, i am getting examination i am i am uh, serving in the capacity of being an examiner in some other college or for some other exam or for some other institution in that case again it is not by virtue of employer employee relationship and it will get covered under efos now agriculture income why would you say i have written agriculture income here is that uh, we know that agriculture income situated in the uh, specified limits of the rural land only is exempt so if there is an agricultural activity happening but not within the rural land but into the urban land in that case too it will be taxable and will be under the head efos depending if it is not going under my business profession so obviously if i am selling that particular agricultural land as a whole that will be capital uh, which is not in the rural area which will be a capital asset will go in capital gain but the income that i am earning will be under the head of course uh, interest received on delayed refund every one of us know that it refund that we uh, uh, get after a time which is not happening this these days are pretty quick to give us refunds but uh, those are the days when we used to get refund delayed refund and the interest earned has to be offered here then director's commission uh, standing as a guarantor again it is not by virtue of him being a director but just as a guarantor that will be a efos income then director commission for underwriting shares again will be an efos income now income received after this continuance of business so i have a business entity the activity of business had got over and after a point in time i get those incomes uh maybe could be one offs then all such income will not part form of pgp will be a part of efos and uh, pass through incomes so we have reits we have in reits uh, where uh, in those we have a few aif some category of aif where the income does not get taxed in their hands and any such income which is passed over to the unit holder the nature of the income remains the same so say if it is passed over to me where i as a unit holder have to pay tax 
I also have a category of pass through income in the uh, ITR, and I will have to see if uh, my income that is passed over to me is in the nature of income from other sources in their hand, and will be income from other sources in my hand as well. So I will offer it. Now, uh, interest on amounts contributed to the provident fund. So generally, we know that any amounts that are uh, under the provident fund, you know, any amounts contributed to the provident fund are exempt. Any uh, under section 10, 11, or section 12. But uh, Finance Act 21 has come out to the fact that uh, if you are making a contribution to PF, uh, where you have your employer also who's making a contribution, then you will be permitted only to the extent of 2 lakh thousand. And uh, if you are a person who's voluntarily making a contribution to the Revenue Provident Fund, then you will be allowed to make a contribution only to the extent of rupees 5 lakhs. If you, if at all you want to make a contribution beyond these specified limits, then any interest income that you earn on these particular uh, amounts which are exceeding this particular limit in a particular year, those will be taxable. Amounts within the uh, uh, specified limit, exempt, interest amount earned beyond these contributions will be taxable under the policy. So how is this calculated is specified under Rule 9D and uh, what the what they have told us in the 9D is that because it is getting applicable from financial year 2122, what I will do is I will try uh, and remove my balance in the PS contribution till 31st March 2172. And uh, now what I will do is from financial year 2122 onwards, what I will do is uh, if say I'm contributing 3 lakh rupees, uh, where I have an employer employee both contributing to it, this 3 lakh of an amount will get bifurcated into 2 lakh 50, which is permissible, and the balance 3 50 will be accounted separately. In the fund, it will be one amount, but I will have to maintain it separately. Why? The reason being that any excess amount from 21 22 onwards, if I contribute, any interest income will be subjected to tax. And this is the manner. So whatever is exempt. I will try and claim that under exemption under 10, 11, and 12, and whatever is beyond the prescribed limit, that will be taxable. So, this will be the manner in which we come. Yeah. Now, uh, coming to the provisions of 56217. Now, uh, 56217, okay, let's go to the next slide where we'll try and understand what is the transaction. The transaction is where a company where public are not substantially interested, which means the closely held companies, they are issuing shares. Then in that case, if my consideration, so the shares have been issued at a value which is higher than the face value, but that particular value is higher than the fair market value also. And if the company who is issuing shares is receiving money over and above the fair market value, then that differential will be taxed in the hands of the company. Now, uh, 56 provisions, uh, 56 to 7B, 56 to 10, all these were introduced in place of gift taxation, where the intention was that the black money or the, the to prevent money laundering, uh, to prevent money laundering. So, uh, any manner where my black money is parked into a white money in, for unreasonable consideration amount. All those kind of scenarios are getting covered under 5627 and 5610. Now, what would be the method? How do you determine what is an FMP? Now, FMP, the law has said that it could be by virtue of Rule 11 UA, read with Rule 11 U. And the methods specified there are the book, the NAV method, which is the uh, uh, book value method, or the DCF method, whatever I can justify. And uh, apart from that, if there is a price which I can substantiate to the assessing officer, if I am permitted that also. Generally, this valuation report is always to be procured from a merchant bank. Now, to, now I'll go to my previous slide where to whom does this section apply? This section originally was applying only to the residents. And the Finance Act 2023 has now brought in an amendment to try and cover it within its ambit the non-residents also. Okay, so who, so today when I am after 1st April 2024, uh, which is financial year, uh, sorry, it is if, uh, assessment year April uh, 24, uh, 24, so it is financial year 23, 24, in which if I have any amounts coming in from a non-resident, 
then I will have to justify the FMB, otherwise it will get taxed under 56 to 70. Now, what kind of uh, 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 exemptions have been given or to whom these sections will not apply? So, say a venture capital fund, which is undertaking consideration from a venture capital company or a fund registered with SEBI, if uh, or an AIF1 or AIF2 who are taking in money uh, or who are issuing shares against uh, a consideration which is higher than the fire market value, for them it is permitted, it will not apply to them because already there is a regulatory who is taking care of this valuation and hence they've been given an exemption. Now, uh, we know the concept of angel tax, right? Uh, there was a lot of buzz few years back when this uh, startup scenario started, right? You know, India is one of, I think, the third most country who is uh, the highest in num number of uh, startups and unicorns that are coming up. So what happened was uh, valuation in case of startups cannot be done by traditional method of NAV or cannot be done by traditional method of uh, DCF or C. There is a totally different scenario uh, as to uh, based on which the valuations are decided. Matlab, when there is a promoter and the investor, that investor believes in that idea that the promoter has got. And based on that idea, he is going to come out with a valuation and there will be a negotiation on the table as to the benefits of uh, 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 having those investments. So, so matter could be something like this, Paytm, where you know, there is a uniqueness uh, of that product and the investor believes that they're going to make a big money. They are going to put in money at a big amount, at a big premium today. Such kind of entities, uh, such kind of startups with a unique idea were facing a lot of problems by virtue of the provision of 56 to 70. And then there was a lot of you and cry among uh, the investor class, among the startups. Now, the government wanted to promote uh, such kind of startups or promoters to come up with ideas because it's ultimately going to boost your economy. And in a way, it was valid also because the valuations are on a different footing altogether. So they came out with a, a, a particular regulation where if you are certified as an eligible startup uh, by the inter-ministerial board of the DPIIT, which is Department for Promotion of Inter Industry and Internal Trade, if you are given a certificate of that kind of startup, then you are out of the ambit of the provisions of 56 to 70, which means if for an eligible startup, if I'm issuing at a premium, which, which is out of uh, uh, the traditional understanding or the bookish knowledge of NAV, which the AOs might not come in, which is also justified, then in that case, they are out of the ambit of 56 to 70. And there are certain class of uh, uh, persons, a lot of countries, so after this non-resident thing has come up, uh, the government has uh, uh, so not, uh, given certain class of investors from particular countries, if they make an investment, they'll not be subject to this rigorous provisions of the P60 survey. So I am not getting into a lot of detail of revenue and everything because I think that is uh, uh, a, a whole chat, a whole session in itself, and uh, maybe we'll be we, we, you know, by going away from our practical topic of issues with the return sign. Then coming to 56 to 10, earlier we had provision of 56 to 7, uh, where only individual HFs were getting covered, and uh, entities like partnerships, companies, trust, they were not getting covered. So to bring everyone into this ambit, 56 to 10 was brought into place from 1st April 2017. And uh, what kind of transactions are there? Let's see. So if my if I have got money from someone and that money is without consideration, which is a gift, and the amount is exceeding 50,000, in that case, the full amount will be subject to tax. Here, you cannot have an inadequate consideration because it's the amount of money that is involved. Then if you have a immobile property, again, here there can be two scenarios without consideration or inadequate. So when there's a without consideration, my, I will try and check what my stand duty value is. If my stand duty value is exceeding 50,000, then the stand duty value will be the amount on which I will, the receiver will have to pay tax. If I have an, I've got an immobile property, which is for inadequate consideration, then uh, uh, say my consideration amount is lower than the stand duty value. And the difference between the two is exceeding 50,000. And they've also given me a safe harbor limit of 10%. If it is exceeding that safe harbor limit also, then the differential amount of the stand duty and the consideration will have to be offered as income from other sources uh, in the hands of the receiver. We are all talking this in the hands of the person who is receiving these assets. 
then there is a movable property again without consideration and if the fair market value of that property is exceeding 50000 then it will be uh, the whole fair market value will be subject to tax then i have a movable property which is for inadequate consideration and if the and if the difference of the fair market value in the consideration is exceeding 50000 then the differential will be subject to tax now here what we are trying to say is that the capital the property has to be this is the list given for property and they have to be a capital asset. So if there is a property which is in the nature of stock in trade, that will not get triggered. So say uh, capital asset being a mobile property, being land or building, that will get triggered. But if the same property is a stock in trade, then it gets covered under 43C provision, 43CA provision and will not get covered here. So the similar provisions have been enacted in 43CA to take care of a scenario of a stock in trade uh, situation. And then if I have a uh, share in security, if I'm receiving jewelry, archaeological collection, drawing, painting, etc., etc., all these kind of assets have been defined. And if my asset receipt of an asset is in this nature, it will trigger 56 to 34. Now, uh, why the definition of relative is there are these categories of relatives. So if I am receiving uh, uh, any amounts from relative, it is out of love and affection. And because it is out of love and affection, that itself is a consideration and hence those kind of scenarios will not work. So these are a few scenarios, a few uh, relationships which we uh, are, which are covered uh, uh, where there'll be no trigger of 56 to 10. Now, when you, we have to be very mindful when we are trying to test it. it let's not assume, let's always try and test whether our relatives are getting covered under this particular relation or not. In case of HUF, it is all the members. So if an HUF is receiving gift from a member, uh, then it is covered. But if it is the other way, where the HUF is giving gift to any particular member, so again, there are two views possible here. It could be allowed, it could be triggered, or it could be disallowed. Disallowed in the sense, it could be an addition could be made. Depending on the judicial pronouncement of the scenario, we have to test it out. Still not clear, there is no clarity on the subject. Now, let us see a scenario where uh, these kind of where uh, where I have an exemption, but in what scenarios uh, will this trigger not happen or there will be no addition under 56 to 10. So like we discussed, if there is a receipt from a relative, then there is a no trigger of 56 to 10. Then uh, in case where uh, there is an occasion of marriage and if on by virtue of that marriage, a person is receiving, it could be a non-relative also. Even in that case, this uh, uh, there's an exemption, there'll be no trigger of 56 to 10. Then, uh, under a will or by way of inheritance. So uh, some some unrelated party under his will has uh, written that, you know, I'm going to get this property. By virtue of that will, I will not be taxed. Or if in an inheritance, if my grandfather or someone has left uh, out a property for me, that will not be subject to uh, uh, deciding the fair market value. In contemplation of death of the payer or donor. So uh, what is this? A scenario where a person is ill, is suffering from disease, and in a very short time uh, is expected to uh, pass away. And in that scenario, while he is ill and uh, in his scenario, in his situation uh, on the deathbed, if he's passing over a pa uh, particular property to me, in that scenario, it will not be uh, a question for fair market value. And uh, it will not be questioned uh, under 56 to 10 and I will not be taxed under 56 to 10. Then any receipt, any uh, receipt from a local authority, which is, Register under 1020. Any fund, houses, trust, foundations under 1023C, any charitable or religious trust registered under 12A, 12AA. All these kind of, uh, so if, if they are making charity and there's a person who's receiving charity from them, then they'll not be covered under this particular uh, uh, 56 to 10 provisions. Then again, uh, another kind of trust who's covered under 1023C, different clauses, uh, any receipt from them will not be covered. Then if I have a private trust created for the benefit of a relative of mine and the creator and the beneficiary are relatives, then by virtue of the receipt uh, from that trust to that relative, there will be no trigger of 56 to 10. Then in the, these two next clauses were covered under the scenario of COVID-19 specifically for that. So uh, if there is some medical treatment, which I am uh, uh, undergoing for myself or my family member and if there is a reimbursement uh, for that COVID illness by my employer, then any amount that I have received from him will not be uh, taxable as he was under 56 to 10. 
if by virtue of covid any person has died and uh, his employer or any other person is giving him uh, giving his family members uh, some amount as a compensation but not exceeding 10 lakh that amount also will not trigger 56 student uh, provisions or income from other people. Now, I'm not going through this detailed thing. There are certain transfers under 47, which we know that are not considered as transfer, which is not considered as capital gains, but uh, could be a trigger under 56 to 10 because there's a receipt of either shares or by the shareholder. Could be a scenario of amalgamation, demerger, could be a scenario where uh, amalgamating company has transferred its assets to an amalgamated company or the demerged company has transferred its assets to the resulting company. Uh, if I didn't have these exclusions, then the assessing officer would try and trigger 56 and hence it was necessary for them to specify this. But uh, your restructuring needs to be seen whether it is covered under this list because not each and every, not every section of 47 is covered here. So uh, while doing that restructuring, this, this will have to be kept in mind. This list has to be, will have to be run through. Now, uh, these were a few examples of what we saw was under section 56. Uh, what, it, what were the permissible expenditure under 57? Okay. So we have 57 which says, I will allow you these many expenditures. We have section 58 which says, uh, I will not allow you these kind of expenditures. Let us see what is that. So uh, nomenclature or the common understanding of the common parlance is that any income that I have earned for a particular income, uh, has to be offered in that particular head, but any expenditure that I am incurring to earn that income, any expenditure which helps me to earn that income should also be allowed for deduction and only the net income should be taxable. The same principle is followed under 57 as well, where any expenditure incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of earning income. So best example that we saw was dividend and interest against that. Another example is where we could say we could use was borrowed funds are given as loan to some other party. So I'm paying interest expenditure, I'm earning interest income. So it's the same. So to earn that interest income, I am incurring expense in the nature of borrowing cost. So that is what will be allowed to me as a deduction. Then uh, it should not be in the capital nature. Obviously, uh, whatever I'm offering for income is going to be in revenue in nature. So expenditure will also be. Uh, will also have to be revenue in nature and capital expenditure will not be allowed. Expenditure cannot be of personal nature, no connection of that uh, income and no connection of the expenditure. And it, if it is in personal nature, it will not be allowed. If I have incurred any expenditure, which is in the previous year, and I'm earn, earning income in the next year, or vice versa, I'm earning income in the year one, and I'm, I have incurred expenditure in the next year. I will not be able to claim a set off. It has to be on the basis of principle of matching concept. It has to be on the same uh, year. Well, so I have to be able to, because on an accrual basis, I will try and uh, claim that particular expense. Now, what are the amounts which are not allowed for reduction? So uh, actually the, this, particular heading of personal expenditure and capital expenditure is given under 58, which says that these are the expenses which are not be allowed. So we are taking under 57 to say that uh, those are not permissible. Now, any expenditure of interest, which I have paid without uh, deducting the eligible taxes, be it under Income Tax Act or be it under DVAA, I am making a payment to a person outside India without deducting these taxes, then that interest expenditure will not be allowed as a deduction. Similar would be in the case of salaries, which uh, if I am making a payment without deducting taxes and it is making a payment outside India, then it will not be allowed. Then uh, something similar to uh, uh, cash payments, which we have under the head PGDT. So all these expenditures are only with respect to those incomes, which are similar to PGDT, but not offered under the head PGDT. So, if I have incurred any expenditure in cash beyond the specified limit, or if I'm giving expenditure to relatives, which is unreasonable, all those expenditures are against income under the head E first, then these expenditures will not be allowed. And any income tax paid or well tax uh, paid, obviously not allowed under PGDT, but there should not be a scenario where it is not allowed there, so I'll claim it under the other head, and that's why the exclusion is very necessary and hence very rightly specified. Now, uh, 
59 is also a section under this particular head of EFOS. And what is it trying to say that we have a section called 411, where uh, under the head PGBP, we are allowed to claim expenditure, loss, or allowance on account of the fact that certain amounts which were my income earlier, I had offered that also. And now they are, they become bad or they are irrecoverable. Uh, and I try and write it off. So those are the debts, bad debts, which I am allowed to be claimed under the head PGBP. There is another section which says, okay, out of these expenses or out of this loss, if at any time you recover it in future years, then I have section 41, which tells me that you have to offer this as income uh, the moment you realize this because you've already taken an expenditure. Now, section 59 is trying to say, okay, absolutely applying the same analogy of that uh, income. If you had any expenditure under the head EFOS and you have claimed that and uh, you had some income, there was a return off, you have claimed it and now you are recovering that uh, return off amount or that expenditure amount or it is getting reversed, then in that scenario, whatever you, we were trying to apply under 41, the same provision or the same logic will apply here and you will have to offer it as income from other sources. Now, uh, then comes the question that uh, if uh, I have bad debts, uh, whether I'll be able to claim because I think we didn't see any such provision specific for bad debts under 57, which allows me deduction. Nor did I see anything which disallows me under 58. Okay, So expenditure is one thing, but bad debt could be a loss where my amounts, say for an example, interest income I had earned in a particular year and offered it. But in the later year, I didn't recover it at all only. I didn't recover it. I mean, the person who was supposed to make a payment to me did not make a payment. He went bad, he went bankrupt, and the debts went bad for me. They were irrecoverable. In that scenario, can I claim this bad debts or a loss under any of the heads, subsections of 57. Now, uh, 1, 2 and others are very specifically for respective heads. Now, 57.3 is one where I'm trying to understand that uh, it says that any expenditure incurred wholly and exclusively for earning income. Now, can I try and take shelter under, the, under this 57 subsection 3 and claim an expenditure? Now, uh, there, is, there is a Kerala High Court decision of Malankara Plantation which says that uh, deduction 57.3 does not uh, 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 a debt which has gone bad, a debt which has become irrecoverable is not in the nature of an expenditure incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of earning that income. It's a loss. There is no specific provision given uh, to cover such a scenario and hence uh, this loss will be not allowed, which is very illogical, right? I have already offered income and now that it has gone bad, how am I not allowed? So uh, under law, nothing specific, under judicial pronouncement, there is a decision against. But can we take an argument that when under 59.1, which we just saw, the previous section, which was trying to uh, apply the analogy of 41, uh, keeping reading that section of 59 with 57.3, can we try and argue that, you know, uh, when it comes to charging of recovery of such amount, you are there, you are charging me that income. Can you not allow, can you not allow me that as a deduction when the debts have actually gone bad? So uh, we don't know what would be the scenario, a possible or probable solution. Maybe we can try it out if your client is uh, ready to take that or the amounts are substantial. No clarity under law, but could be an argument to put forth that when you're taxing me on recovery, you should allow me when it is going bad. Uh, okay. Can there be a loss under the head EFOS? Very unlikely, right? We've, we've never seen a scenario where there could be a loss. But then what do you mean by a loss? Is a uh, loss under any head could be where my expenditure is higher than the income that I have earned under that particular head. So, uh, can there be a loss? Now, uh, for loss, one would like to see the sections which allow you a carry forward and set off of losses. Okay, so we have uh, seventy two for business losses. We have seventy four for capital gains. We have seventy four a only, 
in the case of ecos which covers a scenario where there is a loss by the owner who owns and maintains horses for races that's it there is no other uh, provision for uh, visualizing that income from other sources also could have a loss and hence because there is no provision for carry forward and set off uh, there is no uh, there could be a possibility that the law is imagining that there is no loss that can ever be incurred but say take an example where uh, i have taken borrowing uh, of loan i am taking making an interest payment on those borrowing and in further i am uh, giving those loans on interest to some party say i am charging at 9% and i am recovering uh, say i am charging or recovering the interest income at 9% and i am making a payment on those borrowing at 12% in this scenario i could have a scenario where my expenditure is more than my income okay so uh, net net i have a loss under the head ecos what i can do is if i have other income under the head ecos i can try and claim under the other source under the same head but if it remains unabsorbed then i today don't have any provision to carry it forward uh, also this example was just to explain you what could be a scenario where there could be a loss uh, now in case of an individual who is uh, first of all an individual is not allowed to do uh, the lending of business uh, lend, uh, business of lending of funds you know taking on borrowing and lending it further it was just an example to make you realize that what could be a loss scenario so uh, yes we don't know even if there's a loss at at to an extent we can absorb it uh, uh, under the same head of uh, under the different source under the same head or maybe different head but cannot be carried forward so this is the limitation uh, under the head ecos uh, okay now what could be the precautions that we should take while uh, filing uh, itr in general obviously but also for the head ecos like we discussed previously there could be amounts of dividend there could be amount of interest there could be amount which are not credited to your bank and hence you might not know that try and reconcile your 26 as your ais your tis reports uh, so that uh, those amounts which are not credited to your bank and those are the nature of reinvested amounts you will come to know even a lot of times when you have given bonds uh, funds on bonds and the company has a policy of giving you interest that will be issued to you i mean that is your income on an accrual basis but the company will issue that interest along with the principal amount only after the maturity of that bond even in that scenario you might not know uh, uh, that you know you have to offer this as an income so maybe if the company has deducted tds ais or tis and those entities if they have reported these transaction you will come to know uh so for such kind of an uh, income and you can offer it uh, at the very time of filing the return of income now uh, a lot many information at ais and ts level is given by those entities who are report supposed to report it to the tax department now these particular reports there could be a probable probability that there could be errors uh, in mentioning the span of the assessment it could be wrongly mentioned under your head it could be wrongly uh, the amount could be wrongly given in such scenarios always try and give a feedback uh, for these reports against your pan on the inside portal this will help you to help the department also to not come out with notices when they know that you do not agree with this and there has been some information they will try and check with the uh, department with the concerned uh, parties who have uploaded the report then uh, like we discussed uh, in the bank i always have a net figure coming in 100 rupees is my dividend 10 is my uh tds uh, 90 is stated i have a tendency to take 90 i will forget about the 10 and i will not even check my income to be offered has to be 100 so try and check that then quarterly bifurcation that we discussed wherever available try and put that so that unnecessary wrong uh, uh interest is not charged on you and uh always and always try and check that the data that you have entered yes all of us have software then that software are working too good for us it's all automated but always try and review once your data has been entered that the result that is coming out of that return that you have uh, that the data you have put is correct or not it is charging the income correctly if there is a special rate of income whether you have rightly put it in the respective head it is not going under different head uh, all these as matters which are really small but uh, a little take care taken will avoid uh, your hassle of uh, you know rectification and intervention 
so a few care to be taken uh, yeah thank you this was my presentation and i'm open for uh, uh, questions if any Uh, uh, Hetal, there are questions which are posted in chat box. If you can take them one yeah. by one. Yeah, I will just open the chat box. Okay, so there is a question from Vishwa which says that uh, do we need to disclose gift received from relative in form of equity shares under exempt income? Uh, what I understand is the schedule uh, of the exempt income only covers those scenarios where income have been exempt under section 10 and I understand that a gift by relative is not exempt under section 10 and uh, we generally don't uh, report such kind of transactions. Uh, yes, you have uh, received equity shares and if those are unlisted, then there is a schedule where you have to report the unlisted shares, uh, uh, give the details of it. So yes, there you have to mention but not required under the exempt income schedule. Then uh, Holding company transfers capital assets to its overseas subsidiary. What is the taxability? So, uh, it won't be directly related to your area, but you yeah. can share your view. So, what I feel is, uh, I will try and check uh, forty-seven, and I'll try and check the exclusion list under fifty-six. And if it is covered there, maybe yes. If not, then uh, I think it will have to be tested out. Ethel, there are questions in chat. Yeah, I'm I'm opening the chat box. Yeah. Uh, so one question from Yusuf Chi is that uh, business income if shares are held as stock and trade. Yeah. So this I think I covered this scenario already. That uh, uh, if shares are held as stock and trade and if the income is in the form of uh, dividend, there is a possibility I can. See, nomenclature could be e for it, but if I have to set off my business expenditure or business losses, I can still very well claim it. So that I have covered. Then uh, winnings from KBC. Uh, winnings from KBC. Uh, let us try and see whether it is a game of chance or game of skill. So uh, like we discussed, game of chance is where I don't have to put in any effort. I don't have to... Uh, put any uh, it's just my luck but in case of winning from KBC what I understand is I have that uh, skill I have memorized or maybe I have learned that GK could be a possibility that I could argue that it should not be a special rating but I understand when they are uh, giving you money from KBC it's going to be at 30% they don't want to take a risk and they are going to deduct at 30% which is the special rating yeah uh, whether I will get refund of TDS, whether I will get refund of TDS. Um, I think sorry, question I'm is not, incomplete, maybe. Yeah, I'm not getting the question. Yeah, I think that's maybe either it is in relation to something and that is. Yeah, for sure. Half maybe if you can take it, then maybe we can take it up. Yeah, the unsold tickets will be business loss. Will employee contribution uh, so will the unsold tickets be business loss? Yes, I think uh, if I'm not fetching and I can, uh, because it's a uh, stock and trade for me. So I think I had taken an example where there was a lottery guy who uh, had some stock and trade remaining with him. And uh, if uh, he's not being able to sell it, it should be business loss. Yes. Will employee contribution be not, uh, will employee contribution not deposited by employer be business income or violation of law and be penalized? See, to the, uh, to the extent when uh, he has deducted it from his uh, employer oh, and not made a payment, we generally tend to uh, take it as business income. We tend to make an addition under business income only. Uh, it should not be violation of law. I think there is a direct provision of 36.15a where deduction is allowed and uh, 224.10. So I think it should be business only. Only scenarios where there is no an, not an employer employee relationship, say, where it is a contractor for whom the PF has been deducted and it is not paid, then in that case, it should be covered under the cost. So I think it should be business only. Uh, I have a query related to capital gain. If you can take some, the same after session, it would be great. Uh, do we want to take up this or maybe it can be passed it over to the uh, previous faculty? Uh, Chetan Bhai? 
your voice is little low has become little lower actually okay if you can just check the connectivity is it audible now better better yes now it is better yeah 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 fine sir Yeah, what I was trying to ask was uh, there was a question on capital gains. Do I take it up or maybe uh, it can be passed over to the previous faculty? No, uh, you can share your views. No problem. Uh, that's not a problem. Okay, one second. I have some issue with this. Yeah, uh, I'll try and answer if I can. Let me just see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There no compulsion. I mean, if you have views, you can share your views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a query from Sumit that says that there are three owners of the property and they have sold the plot to a single buyer at uh, rupees one lakh forty. So each one of the shares comes to around uh, forty six lakhs approximately, and we will uh, proportionate the cost of acquisition accordingly and compute capital gains. However, in ITR form three, there is a section which asks for Uh, in case of a transfer of immobile property, please furnish the following details: name, PAN, Aadhaar, percentage, amount, address. So while filing the return of owner one, we have put this, or we need to put this. Uh, they put uh, the whole of the amount of one uh, uh, crore forty lakhs, or we need to put forty uh, six lakh as proportionate amount in the above table. So uh, I think what I understand is uh, I need to define the co-ownership. details when i am giving the details of the owner i will have to also specify which share, his share not the whole of the amount and hence the amount should be 46 lakhs and not uh, 1 crore 40 because the details are specific to the owner maybe uh, you can also put it for the previous fact for uh, tuition income itr 4 filed last year so can we change it to itr 2 for the next year uh i am understanding in one year you have offered it as business income maybe and now you want to uh, maybe go for income from other sources so if you can justify that uh, you know it was your business previously but now not a business and one offs or something yes you can change it obviously uh, there will be a question from the income tax department which will have to be tactfully handled and uh, facts will have to be given can the sitting fee earned by the independent director be treated as a professional uh income same for fee examiner or moderator now uh if you are trying to say professional income i understand you want to take it under the head income from a uh, profession now a uh, independent director so what i understand when can you take something under the head profession is when you are applying a particular expertise or skill being an independent director and sitting getting certain sitting fees just for attending the board meeting and attending to matters and giving your views over there i don't think that is uh, uh, in the nature of professional fees given and things still cannot go under the head income from profession it has to be uh, uh, income from uh, other sources and i think i would apply the same thing for the examiner because uh, there he is just trying to be present uh, for the examines just to examine the students that's what they are not that's what just to regulate them so it is not a specific uh, specialized or expertise uh, that he is offering to and hence should not be professional it could be possible uh, would we get recording for this session you can take it with the coordinators then suddenly what is that reduce okay in case of receipt of gift from relatives do we need to prove the capacity of the donor uh maybe by filing of the return it is not required anywhere it is not not asked anywhere but yes if the information is coming to the knowledge of the assessing officer he would definitely and definitely like to know uh that the amount is coming from whom especially after it exceeds the limit because he would want to try and know if it is, does not fall under any excluded categories then he would want to tax it so yes not today but uh, maybe later on uh, details of the donor will have to be given capacity uh, i don't think so because uh, if it is excluded then not required shall we get the ppt through mail the organizers can answer that volume is very low okay it's shared by speaker
whether I will get refund of TDS deducted on winning from lottery if my income is within taxable limits. So, uh, Ashish, I think my uh, lottery income is taxable at 30%. I will not get a basic uh, uh, exemption also out here. And if they have deducted 30%, then the question of refund does not come in. Uh, because there is no deduction, there is no basic exemption, there is no chapter 6 deduction. Uh, I understand they will deduct a TDS at 30% and uh, that will be the amount that you will have to offer us at the least. Uh, Assessee is NRI for past eight years. Due to COVID travel restriction, he was in India for 160 days in financial 2021 and due to visa for 160 days in 2122. Overall, he was in India for 400 days in the four previous years. What will be his residential status? What will be his residential status? What will be tax on NRE deposits, will it be included under the cost? So uh, I think we had uh, two circulars uh, on this uh, by the CBDT for those people who were uh, stranded during in India during uh, the COVID times. Uh, I don't really uh, recollect those conditions right now, but if I can fulfill that, then there are exclusion of number of days. And if I can... Uh, if, if in that particular period, if I can try and exclude, I will have to then test whether uh, if I was not a resident uh, for that year by virtue of exclusion of these number of days, then it should not be calculated for my residential status. And the NRE that he holds will still be eligible for exemption under 10 4 not to be offered as interest. So I think let's test out that number of days and see if it is getting excluded. Uh, independent directors carry huge responsibility. Independent directors are not earning certainty just for attending the meeting, but in training professional skills and intelligence. I totally agree, Raghuveer, with you that you know it's not an easy task to be an independent director. And uh, but uh, uh, he he is giving his view. He is giving his uh, 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 obviously judgment on the decision. But I still feel that there is nothing. So in a profession, there is something uh, where there is a skill, there is a study on the basis of which uh, he will carry out that uh, that intention he he, go, he goes you know a professional always goes out in the market with an intention to earn profits by virtue of giving his services so uh, independent director does not go there for executing his professional uh, business or something profession or something and hence i think uh, it's it will still qualify under ecos and not professional uh, profession as such so that is my view uh, could be a different view. Maybe I can check for a few decisions on this, but I still feel that it would be false. So uh, I think I have covered all the questions. Uh, if the organizers are taken by if you can let me know if I have missed on to anything. I will just recheck. Okay, there is one more question which says, can I show speculation income? from shares at EFOS. Now, by speculation income, what I understand is uh, intraday trades or any income earned which is getting covered under the explanation to section 70. If you fall under these two, then there is no way out. It has to be offered as speculation income. Same day purchase, that is intraday. You cannot offer it as EFOS. It has to be a speculation income is a business income and even if one transaction, there is no choice. But to operate as uh, income from PG. I think it, it, all questions are covered to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. I I hope uh, so. Thank you everyone for a very patient hearing, and uh, there was a lot of learning while uh, I was also trying to. Uh, Make the PPT, I had a lot of learning as well. So thank you by virtue of this. And thank you, Ketan Bhai, for giving me this opportunity uh, to present the topic today uh, with WS. Thank you, thank you, Ketan Bhai, a lot. Thank you, WS. Uh, hey, hey, Hethal, one or two question. One question somebody has posted in chat, if you can yeah, please yeah, I, I think it. And also you are requested if you can share your contact detail in chat. So if somebody has question, they will contact you over yeah. WhatsApp. Or I something. share my email ID, so anyone can just try and contact me. Yeah, please. You can put it in chat and there's one question somebody had 
उस yeah, if PGPP, then standard deduction of 50K will be applicable. Uh, I didn't get this, sorry. If PGPP, then standard deduction of 50K will be applicable. I didn't get it. If you can uh, put something uh, more clearly. For salaried employee earning FNE. No, so if uh, if uh, there is, even if there is a person who is earning FNO, be it salary or be it a normal person also, FNO is always and always a business income. So uh, cannot mix the two. Uh, if he's earning salary income, he'll get 50K there under the old regime. And his FNO expense, uh, income earnings will always be under uh, PGP. Two separate things cannot be mixed up. Yeah. So I'll just post my email ID. Uh, I'll be more than happy to have answer your questions if there are any. I think given by your own view. Yeah. So uh, I think. All in all, very good session, Hital, uh, and I was very confident when I requested you that it is going to be a good session. And uh, some people have posted that whether PPT will be available. Yes, it will be available. And with the permission of speaker and ICA, we'll host the entire uh, recording also on the website. But uh, you need to go to the uh, WIRC page and from there you'll be able to download the PPT and uh, the recording. Uh, with this, uh, let me hand it over back to Ritika. Ritika, over to you. Uh, yeah. So thanks, Ethel, for uh, a wonderful session. I would uh, now request Shivani to give vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Sri Shivani Padipar on behalf of WRC. I would like to thank you. Uh, I would like to extend my gratitude towards the participants of today's webinar. A uh, special thanks to our distinguished speaker, T.A. Raymond Sadama for sharing the insight and expertise in lighting us on the tactical issues of income from other sources on IT data. And your knowledge has been incredible interesting to us. And thank you so much for this uh, webinar. I also thank you to see Ketan uh, Saya and the third and the twenty area map. I also want you to gratitude our uh, organizing team for uh, for this planning and similar certification. And lastly, thank you for sharing your valuable time to part of this webinar. And your presence and engagement made us this meaningful uh, meeting both informative and enjoyable. And we look forward to more such collaborative gatherings in future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shivani. For the thank you. Thank you so much, Ethel. Thank you for your valuable time. Thank you. Thank you, Ritika. Thank you, WRC.